I wanted to share that um, there's this opportunity to participate in a COVID-19 community archive project. And the goal of the project is to create an archive of material that will be publicly available to researchers at HSU in the future. The project coordinators are looking for people who would like to participate or volunteer to help with contacting people and getting oral histories. Um, and after, after um, we get started, I'll put this link in the chat so that if you're interested, you can um, sign up or, or go, go and get more information. Um, we're ready to get started. And if you haven't already, please mute yourself um, and keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. You, at the end of the presentation, we will be accepting questions and you can put your question in the chat or you can raise your hand or use the raise hand function to ask your question yourself. Um, and we will call on you if you do raise your hand. So um, thank you again for being here today. And um, Jane, will you go ahead and introduce our, um, our presenter today? Hi there and welcome everybody. And welcome Andrea Tuttle, who is an independent consultant in forest and climate policy, focusing especially on keeping forest land in forest use for all the environmental and economic benefits that forests provide. That's interesting. <laughs> An early education in biology alerted Andrea Tuttle to the terrible consequences of global climate change on the natural world. A career in forest and climate policy has let her participate in work in California and overseas, surfing on various boards and positions in Sacramento, including director of the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. She now serves on the boards of the Save the Redwoods League, the Pacific Forest Trust, and most recently the Redwood, uh, Save the Redwood League and enjoys providing updates on climate policy to HSU classes and elsewhere. Andy, it's your turn. So, hi everybody, great to see you. Thank you for the nice uh, introduction and it's wonderful to see um, all of you joining in here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get us going and hope that all of this works. So how does that look? That looks good. And I wanted to mention that um, you can put your questions in the chat. Andrea wants to go through her entire presentation. We'll take questions at the end. Okay. Yeah, when Jane and I set this um, uh, date up, it was sometime last February. And I actually, neither of us had any idea what the contents of the talk would be uh, because politics is always such a, a moving target. And uh, so it turns out that the timing is actually just right, because I think you know that um, on last Wednesday, uh, the uh, President Biden uh, announced his American jobs plan, the infrastructure bill, which is breathtaking in its size and its um, spread of topics that it uh, incorporates. And I will get to that at the end because there's a lot of background and history and substance Bye. and a big picture overview that I want to uh, provide um, before we get to uh, just to last, last Wednesday's action. Um, I always have a hard time putting these talks together because there is so much to say and it's hard to <laughs> discipline myself not to go down some trail with a lot of detail. So I am gonna move through pretty quickly and hit the, the big topics that I'd like, uh, like to present. And then at the end, we can come back to any of them based on your interest and so on. So let's, um, I'm gonna move pretty fast here. So here we go. Uh, this is an update on climate action. And the first thing we have to do is I want to move my gallery away. Uh, I want to move my gallery out of here. How do I do that? There we go. Okay, for me, it's good. Okay, so I want here we are talking about climate change. And I want to start with a reminder of what climate change uh, is 
and what kinds of impacts are happening now, just so you have this as the, the vision of why we're so committed to this um, uh, policy area. So this is an Alaskan village that now is being forced to relocate because of the melting of the Arctic ice cap, which is allowing storm surge to erode the shoreline. And at the same time, the permafrost is melting. So the structural uh, foundations are weak and the cost of relocating this village uh, is very high, of course, to the inhabitants and it's expensive. The same thing is happening on the opposite coast in North Carolina. This is high-end real estate, these beachfront homes. And the question, and they're being uh, affected by higher storm surge and sea level rise. And so what are we willing to pay to save these? Or do we just abandon them to, um, the, to the natural process? These are dead conifers. You might think that they were in California after our beetle kill or in Colorado, but these same thing is happening in Germany. These are drought killed uh, spruce in Germany. Drought in the high elevation areas of the Andes, the Bolivia's uh, lakes, high elevation lakes are drying up due to drought, which affects the fisheries and the people who are dependent on that. And of course, climate change, global warming means exactly that. Um, temperatures get higher, affecting humans who don't have air conditioning or a way to um, get away from the heat. Um, the summers are getting longer. Nighttime temperatures are warmer, which impacts the flowering season and the breeding season and has uh, domino effects through the ecosystem. Here is last September, just a couple months ago, last fall, uh, the beach at Santa Monica. LA reached the highest temperature it's ever had just inland with 121 degrees Fahrenheit. This is real, this is happening now. Just last week in India, they were at 122 degrees. And this is a projection of the CDC, the, um, uh, uh, the US C uh, Communicable Disease uh, 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 Agency, which is, has projected the increase in mortality from rising temperatures um, for new children that are born today in 70 years. This is what they will be facing uh, with very high temperatures in these regions, which this information helps drive us to mitigation solutions and adaptation solutions. But it just shows you that this uh, deaths during to, deaths due to heat are um, increasing. I think you all know that the Arctic and the Antarctic, but the ice cap is melting. And this has tremendous uh, geopolitical implications now, because suddenly new routes are opening up. China is down over here, and their uh, container ships and oil tankers and uh, trade can now get to Europe coming this way, or they have a different access to the East Coast during certain periods of the year. And this opens up whole new um, uh, disputes between countries on right of access. And it's also, of course, opening up whole new areas for more oil development, uh, which is uh, self-defeating, of course. Glaciers on land are also melting, which is one thing for the landscape. It's too it's sad to lose these beautiful glaciers. But more importantly, there are millions of people that are dependent on the water supply downstream. The Ganges River coming out of the Himalayas, um, uh, China coming off of the Tibetan Plateau, the Andes, um, the Colorado Rockies, the Sierra, Alaska, the Alps, they all have communities that are dependent on 
the fresh water flowing off of these and they'll have to find alternative drinking water supplies. On the east coast of uh, Australia, the Great Barrier Reef is dying. The mechanism is that the warmer ocean waters cause the coral to, you know, it's a symbiotic uh, organism. And the coral has uh, algae that lives uh, within the coral's uh, polyps. And the heat causes the algae to be expelled, which means that the coral turns white. They don't have that food source from the um, photosynthesis of the algae. And so the cor coral is starving and dying. Repeated droughts throughout uh, Africa, other parts of the world, the human cost is very high. Uh, the fisheries uh, are lost here in this riverbed in Kenya. And this has direct impacts on our immigration surge on the southern border here. Um, that's such a, a political um, issue. It's we can't say that the that the immigration problem is entirely causal caused by climate change, but climate change is certainly a very important factor driving people off the land in search of a better livelihood. Their crops are failing. Uh, these are the young undocumented miners that are racing to uh, make their way north. Uh, it's very hazardous um, and so on. So that is climate is a driver of um, human population and immigration issues. And of course, we're not immune here in the United States. I know that all of you have heard about the more intense hurricanes and floods and Houston and rainfall and wildfire and droughts and so on. What's happening is that there's more energy in the atmosphere since it's warmer. A uh, warm air holds more moisture and that causes whole different dynamics in the storm patterns um, and, and so on. The extremes become more extreme. So the causal mechanisms are very clear. The blue line is the rise in the um, uh, tonnage of fossil fuels that we've been burning since 1750, which is directly correlated to more CO2 in the atmosphere. The CO2 and the other greenhouse gases act as a blanket. They trap heat in the atmosphere and that's why temperatures warm. This, this looks a little complicated, but the blue line here is the one you want to look at. Here we are in 2020, and you can see that since uh, 1880, we've had slightly over a one degree uh, average uh, global temperature change. And 1.5 degrees is the target that the Paris Agreement uh, says is the point, or, and the scientists, say is the point at which uh, a tipping point is reached and we start to have very significant and uh, long-term uh, ecosystem uh, impacts and changes. So the question is, are we going to be able to uh, change this projected trend uh, through actions that take us away from fossil fuels and get us into a low or no carbon economy? So the Paris goal of the Paris uh, Agreement was uh, to keep global temperature rise to 1.5 degree um, Celsius, which is 2.7 Fahrenheit. And I was fortunate in my career uh, for 11 years, I attended the UN climate negotiations and I watched the conversation um, and, the, and the dispute um, fester for year after year. So that's why Paris was such a remarkable breakthrough. After two decades, the, all the countries of the world finally reached an agreement. And this is what now the challenge is to, to implement it. So how do we actually keep warming to 1.5 degrees? And of course, uh, the prior administration left us with um, a backwards actions. A concept of global warming was created for and by the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. 
He pulled us out of the Paris Climate Agreement. He repealed the nationwide clean power plan, uh, which utilities would have cleaned up their carbon emissions uh, in generating electricity. He rescinded California's authority for regulating tailpipe emissions. He issued new auto standards that actually uh, eventually would increase emissions. He removed the term climate change from government websites and documents and uh, visitor centers. He wrote, rewrote many EPA policies on methane and long-lived pollutants and so on. And of course, we know that he um, didn't speak the truth. And he even removed the climate change page from the EPA uh, website in order to reflect the agency's new direction. So clearly we all know that this uh, living here and all of us are um, engaged and, and aware uh, that elections do matter and administrations can take major changes uh, to um, help address the, the issue. Elizabeth Colbert is one of my favorite authors for the uh, New Yorker. She's written several books on, on climate change. And she says, with Biden, a critical threshold has been crossed. Suddenly, uh, after decades of talking with climate deniers and, uh, and uh, kicking the can down the road, suddenly, uh, the stars are coming together for, uh, for action. Attitudes have suddenly changed after decades. There's a new aggressive administration. The public is now far more alert and aware and talk, willing to talk about climate change. And Congress, which was not even able to use the word climate in, in at least the Republicans, uh, now they do. Not only that, uh, in the government sector, but we also see the private sector, the corporate sector, issuing a wave, a surging wave of pledges that we will be carbon neutral, we will have net zero emissions by 2030, 2040, 2050. But the, uh, we haven't had major improvements yet. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of warming that's baked in and uh, we need to take major efforts to turn things around. As John Holdren said, who was the uh, presidential science advisor under, by, under uh, Obama, and, and now Catherine Hayhoe is saying this, we have three choices. We can mitigate, which means reduce emissions. We can adapt, which means uh, live with it as best we can, or we can suffer. And the degree to which we will suffer is dependent on the degree to which we mitigate and, and adapt. So I'm gonna go through a few uh, quick overview of what the policy options are uh, in trying to address this, who the actors are that we have to, have to deal with, the stakeholders. Uh, go through some of Biden's challenges. Obviously the climate problem is very complex. Where do you even start? What programs do you promote? What is cost effective? Uh, what can get through politically? Uh, we have decades of environmental injustice that, that need to be rectified. We still are facing deniers and dark money and all the um, uh, politics of Congress. But we're 76 days in and we've had a tremendous number of very ambitious steps uh, already and I'll go through those. And there's a lot that's going along in the going on in the private sector that has nothing to do with government. We don't have to rely on government for everything. Um, uh, people are people, companies, uh, the tech sector, many um, areas we see advances in trying to address a low carbon economy. So a new administration comes into Washington and they sit down at the cabinet uh, room and this is their list of things to do. Where do you even start? Well, the basic tools of government policy are you can regulate, you can pass a law saying you shall uh, put in certain technology or reduce your emissions. 
You can offer incentives like car rebates to help you decide to make uh, the purchase of that electric vehicle. Uh, tax credits, those are important in the corporate world. Uh, subsidies, that's what much of the uh, new American Jobs Act is about. You can uh, put a price on carbon. It's um, in the form of either a carbon, I'll talk about this later, in the form of a carbon tax or cap and trade. And you need to have motivated people in charge, which we did not have for the past uh, several years. So who are the stakeholders? I wanna just lay out the big landscape of, um, of all the forces at play. This is very general, but certainly science is telling us what the impacts um, are, what's going on. We have 193 countries around the world. This is a global problem. It needs to be addressed globally. Uh, all these countries have their own politics, their own economics, their own needs for development. Then there are the vested interests that to their credit, they have built civilization. They, the coal industry, the oil and gas industry has built all the infrastructure that we have now and the ways that our, our business and our lives run. And so they um, are very threatened, obviously, as we try to uh, move away from them. But all of our international business, domestic business, much of our agriculture and forestry have been tied up uh, in part with the fossil fuel industry. And then we have the whole financial sector. This is who provides the money to keep these businesses going, invest in their, in their exploration and their um, uh, refineries and so on. So you have our domestic banks, the international banks, the World Bank, the regional development banks, you have the sovereign funds, Norway, Qatar, uh, you have ph philanthropy, Bill Gates, uh, Bezos, Buffett, so on. And you have the insurance companies with very large uh, portfolios that of pension funds that need to put that money somewhere. And the question is, how can we entice them to invest these funds in clean energy rather than uh, the polluting uh, fossil fuel? Then on the other side, uh, we have uh, those who are trying to accelerate the transition to low carbon economy, the media, to some extent, social advocacy, your own personal, your own personal actions, many, many non-governmental NGO organizations around the world are uh, Greta Thunberg and all of uh, that she has mobilized. We have subnational governments that have decided to go off and uh, take action irrespective of what their countries are doing. Some of you have heard my talks before on the California climate strategy and how aggressive and uh, comprehensive it is. Uh, you have the UN that's still working to implement the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. So the point is, all of, these, all of these forces are involved in trying to turn this tanker around and get us going in a new direction. That's what makes it so, so challenging. But Biden has uh, this uh, climate, he knows this issue and uh, somewhere along the line, he was convinced that this was a uh, good political issue for him to take on. It started in the campaign. I don't know if you remember, but uh, the days of all the, all the candidates in the uh, primary debates. Um, but Biden from the very early had four goals and climate was right there with racial equity and the economy and, and COVID. His campaign pledged $2 trillion to fight global warming. And you will see that echoed now with the amount of the bill that was just introduced or the plan. Uh, he pledged uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. He said he was gonna rejoin Paris on day one. And then once he came into, uh, well, once he was elected before he even um, uh, uh, was uh, inaugurated, he had a transition team that put together over 300 pages of recommendations of climate actions that could be taken. 
um, including hiring back uh, a lot of people that had left the prior administration uh, and you need capacity. So the transition plan uh, had a premise of using every lever in the executive branch to get started. And they took on what's called a whole of government approach where every, every cabinet department throughout government is tasked with identifying what climate actions they can take within their own area of authority. And the point is here that climate is no longer just siloed as an environmental issue within EPA, as um, it's now interwoven uh, throughout all government and actions. And this is new. We have not had this uh, political platform um, to work from before. So Biden comes in and on day one, uh, the first thing we're hearing are his appointees and some of the first ones are his climate team. Gina McCarthy, who was head of uh, EPA in the Obama years, is now head of a new White House office. Jennifer, uh, on climate, Jennifer Granholm, the former governor of Michigan who pulled their auto industry out of the recession, is head of Department of Energy. Uh, John Kerry, who was Secretary of State, he is in charge of all the international uh, negotiations on climate. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of he, of course, was important in negotiating the Paris Agreement. And here he is signing on behalf of the United States with his granddaughter on his lap. So he knows this, this area. And then throughout government, every one of these climate of these uh, secretaries has a, a, a background and a charge that they will uh, incorporate climate uh, actions within their area of, of authority. And it's not just the cabinet level, also uh, the ranks two, three, and four down um, of appointees. For example, Trump directed EPA and the Highway uh, Transportation as a, uh, Administration to roll back the clean car standards. And so Biden appointed California experts to reverse it. Uh, Steve Cliff was the deputy officer for the California um, uh, Air Resources Board. And Ann Carlson is a very well-known uh, climate lawyer from uh, UCLA, and they're now in, in charge of uh, reestablishing the uh, language for reversing some of these actions. Science is back in the White House. Uh, the uh, presidential science advisor is Eric Lander, who was uh, one of the key drivers in the uh, human genome project. And he has a new council of advisors, a very high, um, res highly respected uh, people. And on day one, we had a major climate executive order. It goes on for pages. Uh, I don't know how many pages, but uh, you can scroll through it. But at the end of the day, it says, this order directs all departments and agencies to review and take action to immediately commence work. So he's given his um, administrative agencies orders to move forward on carbon-free electricity, uh, zero emission vehicles, halt, at least for a while, new oil and gas permits, end uh, subsidies for more fossil fuel extraction. Uh, invest money in resilience, protect oceans and land. Then he has a series of agencies and uh, groups to advise him, include, including a civilian climate corps, which um, will uh, bring young people in. And the EPA climate webpage is back. It doesn't have a lot in it. It just, so far it says, we are restoring the role of science. And then down here it says, EPA's climate change website is back, more content to come. So they'll be repopulating uh, that. And you get the idea. It's, it's pretty obvious here. Uh, climate is uh, the marching orders. So we have a very solid foundation to start. We have competent people at the helm. We have this whole of government uh, approach. And the next steps now are to fund it and implemented. 
So where do we, where do we actually uh, need action? Well, let's look at where emissions come from. Transportation is our largest source of emissions. And that's true in most of the developing world, a developed world where transportation um, is, has surpassed electricity as the main source of greenhouse gas emissions. Electricity is still right up there about a third. Industry, uh, 20% commercial and residential and ag, so on. But the point is, that you can't just address one of them. There's no silver, silver bullet. You have to address them all. So I'm gonna look at two of them. I'm gonna look at transportation and electricity and go, go a little bit um, deeper into them. So the, the challenge here is we have a, a truck and automobile fleets around the world that are based on gasoline, fossil fuel, uh, combustion, and it's far cleaner to have that energy source come from electricity. Um, but it's a chicken and egg problem. People won't buy an electric car unless they know they, there is a charging network uh, and how far can I drive with it. And so this these two have to go hand in hand, making uh, EVs available and giving them places to, to recharge. You may have heard that Newsom has banned, or that our governor in California has banned the sale of new gas power cars in California by 2035. So how are we going to get there? Actually, all, almost all of the major auto manufacturers now have EVs either for sale now or they are ready to roll in just a few years. And this is not just your... Um, uh, your Fords and Chevys and uh, Jeeps and Kias and so on, but it's um, also your, your SUVs and your trucks, which are one of the largest selling uh, portions of the, of the auto market. And this is not just for the, our sedan and our, and our passenger vehicles, but California Air Board has now passed um, a regulation saying that we will phase out all diesel trucks. These major shipping um, uh, uh, semis that uh, go across the country. So it's not, it, it's, it, it, this is doable. We already have examples of uh, pilot vehicles that are showing up and with time it's the idea of lowering the price for them by having a demand and having charging um, these are particular vans and and uh, so on are particularly good for predictable routes where um, you know where you can charge and come back and get another charge you have fixed fixed routes but also the long haul as long as you have a network um, it, it can be done. Our own Congressman, Jared Huffman, has recently uh, offered a bill that would require the U.S. Post Office to convert to electric delivery vehicles. And hand in hand, we are starting to see charging networks show up. I don't know if you recall, but uh, several years ago, Volkswagen was caught with fraudulent emis emission um, uh, uh, testing. They were reporting incorrectly, they were uh, rigging their emission systems so that when they're being tested, they uh, tested falsely. And as um, uh, restitution, tremendous fines and a whole legal settlement, but Volkswagen is helping to build out this uh, cross country charging uh, network. And uh, so that just needs to densify uh, with, with time. Batteries are the new oil. Uh, we need to be able, this is where technology is driving. There's many, many podcasts that I listen to about the new advances in technology. I hope, I hope some of you will, um, will listen to those because they're just fascinating on all the ideas on how do we actually tackle this. Petaluma has banned new gas stations. <laughs> um, uh, if we want to be carbon neutral by 2030, we have to make these changes, says the mayor. 
So if you're going to build uh, new uh, stations in Petaluma, you have to have uh, electric charging stations rather than gasoline. So that's a, a quick overview of the transportation sector. Here's electricity, which is the other largest uh, source of greenhouse gas em emissions. Over the past decades, we've made just amazing uh, advances in uh, new solar and wind development um, in many parts of the country. But the issue now is that how do we move that energy from the source where it's generated to where the load demand is in the, in the large cities? Our transmission lines, our grid is um, dated, it's uh, old, it's uh, not up to the task, uh, and a huge investment is needed here. And we also need to be able to store the excess wind and solar that are generated during the good periods. And what do we do at nighttime? What do we do when there's no wind? Storage is another key element here. So here's uh, uh, visually uh, the picture of where we have wind development now. And of course, this is based on where the wind, natural uh, wind corridors are. And here is where solar potential is. Notice all this red area here. This is where you ha have the highest daily total of, of uh, photovoltaic potential. So that's an obvious place to develop solar. But this is where the grid is. You can see that we just don't have a very dense network of long transmission lines to get it from where the sources are into the load centers. So that's why we're putting so much investment into the grid. Now talk about storage. There's lots and lots of proposed technologies, lots of different battery configurations and new anodes and cathodes and electrolytes. And the question though is at what cost? Um, we also have to de develop our own sources of lithium and cobalt because today we've been largely dependent on um, South America, China, and this is part of our uh, hardening our own domestic supply chains that we, where we need investment. So we've gone through a lot of different options for long-term storage. These are, this is a 2020 um, article saying, well, these are the five that seem to uh, have the most promise. This one here, pump back hydro, we have this in California in limited uh, locations in the Sierra. This is a very popular in Norway, where, oops, where you have um, the ability when you have cheap renew, extra renewable energy, you pump water back uphill and then you release it when you need energy and you turn the turbine. So this is a repetitive cycle using excess energy when you have it. Same theory over here. You, it sounds pretty simple, but uh, you raise blocks, heavy, whatever, uh, concrete blocks, stone blocks, up when you have excess energy, and then you lower them down when you need energy, and that turns the turbine that generates the electricity. And then there's uh, the idea of compressing air and storing it either above ground or underground. And then there's different kinds of batteries that seem to have potential. So this is just giving you an idea of where what technologies, at least at the moment, seem to have the highest uh, 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 success uh, potential uh, at scale. Hydrogen is uh, another potential. They're working on this particularly uh, companies are investing uh, in Europe. There's then the question that all of the mitigations to reduce our carbon um, emissions are just not fast enough. No matter what we do, the emissions, the warming is going to uh, go faster than we can mitigate it. And so we 
may have to, at the rate we're going, we may have to just directly capture CO2 out of the atmosphere. This, this uh, on the left is a, is a real plant that's a demonstration plant. This is a hypothetical schematic, but the idea is that you would uh, chemically and with electricity uh, compress, extract CO2 and then store it underground. There's, you can imagine all the issues uh, wrapped up with that. And another one that uh, no one wanted to talk about, but they're starting, the National Academy is starting to say, hey, things are so serious, we, we may actually need to do this. The idea, here's, here's a volcano, and we know that temperatures drop after all these particulates and sulfur particles are um, ejected into the atmosphere. And so the natural thought comes about, uh, should we put something up into the atmosphere just to scatter the sun's rays, reflect them back? This is a, uh, one of the topics that Elizabeth Colbert has in her new book, Under a White Sky. That's the idea that we'd have all these particles up there uh, trying to reflect heat. Um, it's a it's a great book. She goes into several uh, climate uh, challenges. I, I recommend it. So I talked about transportation and electricity, and these other three I don't have time to go into. But obviously, um, industry has to lower its carbon intensity. Our building fleet um, around the world needs to be more efficient. We need insulation. We need better lighting. Uh, and the ag and forest sector, there's many, many gains that we can uh, attain there if we invest in them. So let me uh, move off of the, um, of the technology of what do we do about emissions and, and talk about some of the other actions that are going on. These new corporate climate pledges are, are very surprising. I wasn't prepared for them. Suddenly, these private sectors are making voluntary commitments to become carbon neutral by 2030 or 50 or whatever. And they are realizing um, that for their own reputational risk, they do need to say that they have a climate um, uh, friendly uh, plan. They get pressure from their public, from their shareholders, from their own employees who want to know what their company is doing. Uh, they're having to disclose more and more uh, the risks of their uh, exposure to climate change. And so we're starting to see that more and more companies have, are, are making, taking these pledges. Here's the one for British Petroleum, which is an oil company. <laughs> what, how do, what do they do? Uh, they say they're going to be net zero across their operations by 2050 or sooner. Uh, they're going to somehow uh, new, um, offset what emissions they do have. They're going to cut the intensity of their products. They're going to measure their methane. Uh, they're, and basically, they're going to change their investments over time into non-oil and gas. Bezos made a, a big announcement. He's uh, providing $10 billion to these organizations here and uh, uh, climate, climate research. Of course, the question with these is, there's a lot of skepticism on, are, is this just talk <clears throat> or is this, um, is this real? And it's, uh, we do want to be encouraging and want to support this and we would definitely want it to happen. But I think you'll find more and more advocacy groups making sure holding holding these companies uh, to their to their pledges. Different topic: the topic of environmental justice, which is very important to the current administration. There are uh, decades of inequities where polluting facilities have been um, on purpose placed in um, low-income and disadvantaged communities. Racial equity was one of the four original campaign goals, and Biden has, has just as climate as is interwoven throughout his administration, so is language on environmental justice. And if you read the new infrastructure plan, you will find the term 
um, environmental justice uh, throughout it. He's also made a pledge that 40% of the benefits from his climate pledges will go to disadvantaged communities. And he's taking a, 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 a card from California. California has a similar commitment to recognize social equity. And we designed a, a database by census tract that measures um, that, that can be used to target where climate funding should go. Where are the areas that most uh, need it? So here would be a, a blow up of that and down to the census tract level. And for each one of these, there's a pollution burden index and uh, uh, various other demographic data, which helps to target uh, investments. So here's a map of asthma in the uh, LA basin. So this helps you um, focus your efforts to reduce pollution and uh, invest uh, mitigation and adaptation. Carbon pricing is always a challenging topic. Um, the idea is that when it's expensive to pollute, you do less of it. Uh, you can either use a carbon tax approach or an, um, some sort of trading system, cap and trade, which is what California has. And it's not a, um, it's not a foreign uh, mechanism. It's been going on across the world in many uh, countries, both developing and developed. But of course, the U.S. is obvious in its absence, except that uh, California here and Quebec, this is our trading, uh, trading partners. Um, so there are, the idea of carbon pricing is still very much um, in the discussion, although Biden has not taken up carbon pricing yet. It has so much uh, complexity and uh, uh, dissension about it, but uh, Kerry, of course, knows the issue from his uh, days with the uh, Paris negotiations, and he is a firm believer that markets and pricing are a, a very important part of uh, solving climate change, not just regulation. Uh, here's a new carbon tax expert that has been hired within the administration. He says, for any policymaker with the goals of deep carbonization, and, and a strong economy, putting a price on carbon is a no brainer. So even though we're not seeing much action on it now, I think probably in the next three years, we may see more focus on, on pricing. Biden said, okay, we're going to rejoin Paris. Um, so now we're back in and we have to live up to the obligation. What we need to do, the next uh, negotiations are in, here in Glasgow in November. They'll probably be virtual, but we'll see. Uh, part of being in Paris is that every country must make a pledge on how and how much they're going to reduce their emissions. So um, Biden has to come up with what his pledge will be. We don't know, but it is probably going to be announced at a White House climate summit that's going to be held uh, this April, right around Earth Day. And uh, this is where we'll get more details on what uh, the US is going to say about its international commitment on climate. What, what I suspect will happen is that we'll get a general look at this climate summit in April, and then we'll get a more a definitive detailed look in the fall when the uh, uh, climate negotiations uh, occur in, in November. So now I'm going to start wrapping it up here uh, with the grand announcement that just came. Here we, here we have this solid foundation. We have people, we have direction, we have authority, we have commitment from the very top. And last Wednesday was the grand announcement of the infrastructure bill which is not a climate bill. It does not have the word climate in the title. It's a jobs plan, uh, building back uh, our nation's crumbling infrastructure. 
but when you read through it, it is breathtaking in its scope. It's um, the current proposal is $2.3 trillion over the next eight years. And these are all in billions. Uh, repair roads and bridges, public transit, airports, ports, rail service, incentives for electric vehicles, replace all the lead pipes um, in uh, water systems, in old, old, old water systems throughout the country. You remember the story in Flint. Water and sewer upgrades, broadband is infrastructure, uh, a large amount there for um, universal broadband. Improve the grid, plug these uh, abandoned oil wells that are leaking methane. Methane has a very high uh, global warming potential. Uh, clean up brownfields, demonstrate more hydrogen and direct air capture, create this uh, civilian climate core, uh, address certain EJ uh, environmental justice inequities, um, lots of resilience, retrofits, home and community care as infrastructure, industry, workforce, schools, veterans administration, and quite a bit just are, um, directed to uh, tribes along the same line. So how does he propose that we're gonna pay for all this? Of course, this is where the heat and lightning are flying. He wants to increase the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28%. Prior to the Trump uh, tax cut, it was at 35% just to put it in perspective. So there's a whole series of other tax um, uh, loophole closing, eliminate all the fossil fuel subsidies and so on. Have more enforcement of, uh, by IRS of corporate tax reporting. So this is the, um, the pay for side of the bill and that's where a lot of the opposition um, shows up. Just. You're familiar with this, but the immediate reaction on the Republican side, I'm going to fight them every step of the way because this is the wrong prescription for America. And then you have um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It's not enough. We need we we don't need two trillion. We need ten trillion. So uh, this is the conversation that you'll be watching uh, now as the as uh, what happens is that the Biden text of the plan goes to the House Ways and Means Committee because we, uh, the House is where uh, finance bills uh, originate. And that's where we'll start seeing the bills emerge that actually uh, take the language uh, to, to implement it. So I'm gonna stop here. You've got the giant overview and I just wanna be cognizant that this is hard stuff. It's been very heady to see so much positive action already coming out of a new administration, but the vested interests are still there. They are dug in. It is how their uh, its business model is uh, based on fossil fuels, and they will use every possible tool they can uh, to slow this down or to uh, uh, sandbag it. But I've been at this for a long time now. Um, I don't know, I, I go back a long time giving these talks. And the, the, it is so much different now uh, from what we've been fighting for the last many decades that it is just a huge uh, new horizon and um, uh, encouraging uh, looking forward. So I'm going to stop here, and now we can now we can open um, open it up for for a discussion. So I'm happy to take uh, questions and so on. Now, thank you so much, Andrea. Um, we do already have a question in the chat, and the first question is: How environmentally friendly are the batteries that are being developed? How often do they need to be replaced? Uh, this is exactly the conversation that has to happen with every single piece of technology that we use to address fossil fuel. Um, yeah, uh, batteries have their own pollution um, um, uh, footprint, first with the materials that go into them, and then what do we do to recycle them afterwards? So these questions Yes, we definitely need to get our transportation sector off 
of fossil fuels right now, electric, electric batteries, um, uh, but maybe we'll have hydrogen cars. Uh, technology and cost will drive this, but just like um, uh, plastic bottles, everything, there's, uh, you cannot do just one thing. And so, um, uh, yes, a, 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 a recycling industry, a reprocessing, the value of the lithium and the cobalt is so high we may, um, one idea is that the car batteries only last so long and they have to have a certain amount of oomph to make the car go, but they still have capacity even when they're no longer uh, functional as a car battery. There are, I've seen discussions of uh, linking them together and using them for long-term storage. Uh, so this this is the, the chicken and egg and where entrepreneurs and um, uh, the, the new inventors uh, and, and the tech sector come in. Uh, it's absolutely a perfect relevant question and we'll have to cope with it. So everybody, I, I would um, encourage you, you can put your question in the chat, but if you'd like to ask your question yourself, you can raise your hand or use the raise hand function and I'll call on you. Um, I'm gonna read one for the chat and then I'll call on you, Ted. So the next question is, are there tax incentives built in to encourage solar and electric vehicle conversion? Uh, this has been a political football. Um, the originally, uh, well, within the last, what, decade, uh, less than that, uh, we've had federal and state rebates for purchasing electric vehicles. Um, when I bought my LEAF, which was many years ago, um, I got $7,500 from the feds and quite a bit from the state. So the, per, so the sticker price was uh, quite a bit lower. And this is the incentive type of government policy um, uh, approach. Now, uh, as the funds for those rebate programs dry up and certainly under the past administration, they were not uh, replenished. Um, uh, I can't tell you today because I'm not in the market. I don't know exactly what rebates and uh, tax incentives are there, but if you look at the Build Back Better uh, infrastructure plan and look at the actual text, you will see more detailed language on uh, just your question. Yeah. All right, Ted, do you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself. There you Just go. A, a wonderful presentation. Uh, very positive. Uh, and I had a couple of uh, problems in my mind. One was uh, two, two elephants in the room. One is China and one is airplanes, flying elephant, I guess. So um, huge. You, you flashed a picture of an airplane, but didn't say anything about the problem yeah. of airplanes. Yeah. And uh, China, I have heard, is the major uh, contributor. And uh, how are we going to get them to come along? Um, good question. Uh, China is, yes, the world's largest emitter. They are still very heavily dependent on coal. Uh, they uh, uh, broadcast. Uh, and promoted how much wind energy they were putting into place. And during the time that I was going to the climate negotiations, China was quite proud of all the investments in clean energy and so on. But at the end of the day, they are still the largest uh, uh, consumer of coal for their power sector as their economy continues to grow. Uh, Kerry, uh, John Kerry knows China very well, knows, uh, but China also is very severely affected by climate change. They are suffering um, a lack of runoff from the mountain glaciers. They have dust storms, they have heat waves, they have all the impacts of climate change are uh, writ large on some part of China. So they know the issue. It, it, a climate is probably one of the uh, most straightforward areas where we will be able to negotiate with them. 
they're, they know the issue. They are very savvy. <laughs> They've been, I watched them at the climate negotiations for a long time. They know exactly what's going on, but they have, like everybody, any country, you have to balance the needs of your population, the needs of your keeping yourself in power and where the money is, um, and uh, try to uh, find a path. So I, I can't, we can spend a lot of time talking on China and you can do a lot of reading um, on it, but you're absolutely spot on to raise that as an issue. Aviation, what do you do? Are you going to uh, have an electric battery in your plane? Well, probably not for the way that we're used to uh, flying, but there are, uh, you will find articles on short distance aviation using, using batteries. The approach that the aviation sector, I don't know if you've heard of CORSIA, C-O-R-S-I-A, the approach of the aviation sector, they realize they're vulnerable because it's so hard to replace uh, jet fuel. And they see the only way out for them is to have an offsetting strategy where um, uh, the emissions that they do produce will be offset by increasing removals, carbon remo removals somewhere else. Uh, Corsia is their approach using tropical forests to offset. This has been mired in controversy. That's a topic for a whole nother presentation um, on forest carbon. Uh, but they, they, so Corsia is one path that they are pursuing. But this direct air capture, uh, storing CO2 underground, uh, we can, you know, originally this direct air capture business was for oil, co oil companies have already been using that. And they, um, but the reason they were injecting uh, air or CO2 back into the ground was because they wanted to loosen up more oil <laughs> reserves underground. Uh, so that's kind of self-defeating, but you can imagine a system where the geologic formations that are available to hold long-term uh, the carbon underground could be sold as an offset to an emitting sector. So these are just the kinds of ideas that um, uh, uh, are, are being talked about. Um, and again, cost is the driver. Uh, then until we have an economy of scale that drives the prices down, um, uh, it won't happen. And, and that is linked, of course, to also having regulation that forces action. So that's part of the story. So those are good questions. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question is, how is this reasonable scientific set of actions being explained to the general public? <laughs> Here you have it. <laughs> um, well, we've only, what is it? We have 76 days of the administration so far. And of course I'm particularly attuned to it. And so you can tell I did screen, screen captures every time I saw something emerging. Um, uh, it's it's all the different worlds. It's the political world. Biden needs to sell his message. He's got Buttigieg out on the Sunday talk shows talking about the great things of this of this new uh, a new plan. Um, it's uh, social media picking it up. It's all the all the vehicles uh, that we use. Um, where you want, there's, there's several parts to it. One is to convince the general public that this is important, that we want to support it. That then gives um, backbone to the elected um, representatives to vote the way they ought to vote. Um, and what you ultimately, you want to encourage government action to the extent we can, and you want to reward private sector action, and you want to reward science for investing in research and development. So it's um, all those things that that's why I put that big uh, uh, display up of all the vested interests was all those pieces need to be engaged. Thank you. Do you see the tech 
fixes being developed at the pace needed to address the speed required to address the problem? Well, that's, that's the trick. Um, how fast are countries, you know, during, frankly, during the Trump administration, all this energy and, and enthusiasm uh, about doing something in every country uh, after the high of Paris uh, died off. Well, if the U.S. isn't going to do it, why should we, um, you know, affect our economy? So we need to regenerate the energy globally to start focusing on this and, and uh, um, get back into it. And that's why, read, read Elizabeth Colbert's, Colbert's book on um, the white sky. She's, uh, if we do not mitigate and become adapted soon enough, uh, things will be extremely difficult and we will at that perhaps the price point will come where we just have to either use the geoengineering solution of spraying particles in the atmosphere or injecting more carbon underground or more sequestration in trees and biological systems. Um, it, it, the question was, are, is it going to happen? Is the tech fix going to happen fast enough at the rate of climate change? And the answer is, it depends on where we put the investment and how, how we respond. Right. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. The federal government in California designates burning wood to make electricity as carbon neutral because trees are part of the carbon cycle. But trees can't grow fast enough to keep up with all that carbon. What do you think is the most effective way to lobby California to change its designation <clears throat> of biomass? Uh, that's the topic of a whole nother um, session. I spent a, a, a lot of time um, on that very question and the issue of the life cycle assessment of forest carbon. Um, uh, I was recently, I was turned off, but I was recently on the board of the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, which has a $200 million uh, endowment that they uh, uh, invest across the country in different forest uh, uh, activities. And one of those is a demonstration plant in Oregon, in John Day, Oregon, where, uh, you know, we have a... a, a fuels problem in many of our forests where they're overgrown, too many stems per acre, they need to be thinned, they're not natural. And what do you do with that low value uh, uh, wood products that come out of it? There's no market for it. So this John Day project is to chip that material. Uh, it's from Forest Service land. They have a stewardship agreement, a sustainability agreement. They remove it sustainably from the forest. They chip it and then they uh, treat it like roasting coffee beans. It's called torrefaction. And those pellets, those black pellets, will then be, uh, the, the intent is that they will become a fuel source for Korea, Japan, uh, that has a feed-in tariff. They're trying to get off nuclear. They're trying to get off uh, coal. And so that is one idea of how forest biomass could be used in a uh, carbon positive way. But the questioner also said, well, do trees grow fast enough to replace the rate? And again, this is a flow question and a rate question. Uh, you, we, <laughs> you can think of all the elements here. If we have too much fuel in the forest, then we could then officially remove some of that and get those forests back into better uh, resilient shape. Uh, but, but you're absolutely right. We can overdo it. We can vacuum them out and then it's no longer a carbon um, uh, positive uh, cycle. As far as California defining uh, biomass as carbon neutral, I, I need to look that up. I know the federal government under the Trump administration did that. I am not entirely uh, sure that California has that overt policy position. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there modeling being produced as to how we need to adapt our communities and food production to the erratic climate changes, increased storms, flooding, seawater rise? 
Uh, can you say the first part of the question again? <clears throat> Is there modeling being produced? Meaning climate models? I think I think so. It says an example of use of vertical food cultivation near cities reforestation. Are we planning well, ahead well, basically? Are we planning ahead and projecting exactly how we need to adapt our food production, uh, our transportation systems? In other words, we're going to have to change by a certain point because it's going to be uh, there's going to be so much dust, there's going to be so much heat. People can't stay by the shoreline. At what point, because of sea level rise, um, the fishing stocks well, let me, are down. Let me, we, need, we need to parse this out. That's what I was trying to do in my talk is that, yeah, the, the, the basic answer is yes, there is an enormous amount of quantification, modeling, projections. That's what the IPCC is, the International Panel on Climate Change. They come out with global climate assessments. The state has, California has its own assessments. There are, uh, if you do any, any uh, Googling at all, you will find mountains and mountains of climate models uh, on different parts of the economy. Um, and each one, uh, this life cycle assessment. So I'm, I'm not quite sure. There's lots and lots of data from the science community on what the um, cause is, what the projected impacts are, and what the rate of impact. I'm is. not asking about rate of impact. I understand all that. There are lots and lots of models. The issue is, are there models of how our communities will need to change? How our industrial oh. commercial food production will need. Well, to look at look. Humboldt County has a climate plan. Every many many levels of government have looked at uh, what their own uh, carbon footprint is and how they can act locally. That's what the Petaluma ban on gas stations was. Um, the answer is yes. There is climate action at every level of government. Every level of uh, Non-NGOs, uh, environmental organizations, 350. Um, I mean, you can find uh, lots and lots of information depending on, I think the question needs to be more specific. Agriculture, vertical, uh, vegetable growing, um, non-meat diets, um, uh, soy production, you name it. There is our climate, I'm sorry, there are carbon assessments, which then lead you to different alternatives on what do we do about it? How, how, how significant is it and what do we do about it? Um, there are things clearly that we personally can do on, in our own life uh, style, and we need to be cognizant of that and do what we can. But let me just say the problem is much, much bigger than just our own decision to recycle or, um, you know, give up meat during the week. Uh, it, these are structural, economic, fundamental economic changes that need to uh, convert our entire fossil fuel economy and all those sectors in the pie chart. Sorry, lost you. <laughs> um, and all those, all those sectors, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's structural change, which is why having the United States at the highest level, at the presidential level, have someone who knows this is so crucial. It is so new. We have not had this in the past. So I, I, I know that's a, a wide ranging answer, but um, uh, there's a lot of parts to that, to that question. I, I personally am optimistic. Um, uh, I see so much more action now. I mean, we were battling, banging our head on the wall 10 years ago. And now far more uh, people are, know the words and know the, know the mechanisms and understand the problem. And there's a lot of young people who are going into this um, field who, who know it's their, their lifetime and their children that is going to take the biggest brunt. Do you think that um, HSU's uh, moving to a polytech will incorporate um, major aspects of climate technology development? 
boy, it sure plays to our strength. Think of, yeah, think of the, um, well, I mean, this is a whole nother topic on the fate of, of Humboldt, but Humboldt has been suffering from an enrollment decline and uh, budget uh, 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 problems, as has the system, but Humboldt in particular uh, needs to look for an infusion and uh, the strength of one of the key strengths of Humboldt is our uh, expertise in resource management, fisheries, wildlife, forestry, uh, botany, biology, oceanography, all of those. Um, and the uh, Schatz Energy Lab is worldwide known for its work on microgrids and appropriate technology. Uh, so, we, so we have the core bones for a strong to attract STEM students to come here and have specialized majors uh, in STEM fields. Uh, that doesn't mean that we uh, ignore or, uh, or downplay where we're also strong in the arts and music and, and humanities, but it would be a way to attract, Cal Poly is a prestigious degree uh, in a STEM field um, we would be one of what, only three in the CSU system. So uh, it's kind of off topic, but I personally, I, uh, I endorse that idea. Right now, the faculty are in uh, committees putting to, looking at different aspects of what would be needed to take on um, a Cal Poly designation. The, the, uh, as I understand it, it came as a an invitation from the chancellor of the CSU system. Uh, hey, Humboldt put together a proposal and that's what they're doing. Because you also have to look at the funding aspect of it. Will we get any additional uh, support from the system as a whole to help us get started? I'm gonna read a question and then Bird, you're next. So let me read this question first. What's the time frame for removing stationary sources of emissions in residential settings? For example, natural gas stoves, ovens, clothes, dryers, and replacing those with electronic appliances. What, what's the time frame for the building code changes? That's a good question. I can't answer it specifically. California has very strong appliance standards. And, um, but during the Trump administration, all the clean energy star, clean appliance uh, standards were rolled back. And Biden, as part of the laundry list of things that are in his uh, first executive order, uh, were to reestablish, let's see, um, reestablish the fuel economy standards, reestablish the appliance and building efficiency standards. So this is regulatory. You will be seeing uh, EPA and what other department is probably responsible for energy efficiency? Um, but you will see regulations coming out that will put timelines. This, this has to, um, you've also seen cities taking action to ban, like Berkeley uh, is banning all new gas uh, services in new, new or remodeled residential construction by such and such a year. You need to look at each entity on its own to see what target date they have. Um, but this is definitely, uh, it's, it's, it's partially retrofitting the existing fleet of appliances that we have, but it's also uh, constraining putting uh, new, um, uh, new services in. Thank you. Bird, go ahead. Um, this is maybe a little bit, um out of what you're talking about, but I understand that many of the fossil fuel corporations are looking to plastics for their next um, money-making big deal, um, including single-use pl plastics so that, and they are um, encouraging recycling for that. So we're looking at um, not just the fossil fuels changing our whole environment, but the pollution of plast uh, plastics changing our environment. And I wonder if any of that is being considered in all of the um, changes for 
fossil fuel uh, corporations? Good question. I've been reading of some of the same things that you're referring to. Yeah, when the oil companies, you know, they have known about climate change for decades. They were the driver in the uh, denier um, uh, world. Um, and in their support of political candidates that would uh, uh, deny climate change and not take any action. Yeah, the oil companies uh, are being exposed as having known about the climate impacts of combustion for a long time. And so, yes, as a business model, what are you going to do? And many of them have turned their oil uh, products into um, uh, industrial chemicals and plastics as an alternative. Now we have vast areas of the oceans um, and beaches around the world utterly littered with, um, with plastic. Um, so I don't know where to go from there. It's, it's kind of obvious what you say. You, um, you regulate, you, you force... Uh, Oh, part of, part, of, part of what I remember uh, hearing is that they are trying to put the guilt on us for using this stuff. Oh, uh, it's your choice to pick the plastic bottle. It's your choice. Um, uh, we, put the, we put the recycling symbol on the bottom so you feel better when you put it in the recycling bin. But of course, uh, when it gets picked up, it all ends up in the same place. And it's not being effectively recycled, but the oil uh, sector is saying, well, that's not our job. That's somebody else's job to develop the technology to recycle it. Um, so it's kind of a self-answering question. Okay, we go after those, those areas. Um, I don't have any, any magic um, yeah. <laughs> better answer there, but, but, but you're absolutely right. It, um, watch watch the um, oh, the advertising and the messaging that comes out of the oil sector uh, as they try and face up to the plastic problem now. Thank you. There's a comment in the um, chat that says there's a move to have the city of Arcata do an ordinance to ban gas appliances in new buildings by 2030, but that but I'm not sure of the exact date. <laughs> Well, that's a place to show up at the city council and and learn, um, bring information, bring bring your um, opinions on it uh, to help mold the policy. And I have one more question in the chat. Um, <clears throat> is there a limited amount of time to engage? Question. Oh, sorry, sorry, wrong wrong question. Um, since we're already experiencing melting glaciers and permafrost, what is the projected year when we reach the tipping point where it's irreversible? I'd refer you to some, uh, uh, there's different stories in the Arctic and the Antarctic, and I'd refer you to some of the really interesting work uh, on the on the Antarctic, well, both of them, um, <laughs> but I was just reading something about the Antarctic that as some of these, may, some of these major huge uh, glacier or blocks of the ice shelf start breaking off and floating north and melting, um, th that the rise in sea level will be faster than we thought it was going to be. I don't have specific numbers for you right now. That's the kind of thing that I would go online and do the research on because there's lots and lots of projections about um, varying levels of sea rise uh, over time based on different assumptions of Greenland melting, the Arctic ice melting and Antarctica melting and breaking off. So uh, it's a good, good question and something for a good uh, research effort, but you can find it. You can, you can find projections. And then um, what about the argument that eliminating gas will encourage use of electricity, much of which comes from gas? Actually, uh, when you do the life cycle assessment, um, getting away from coal uh, and converting to natural gas, and if you then generate your electricity from natural gas, 
that is still cleaner than the inefficient combustion in individual car engines. So uh, natural gas is not the answer. What you ultimately want is more renewables. And that's the assumption behind a lot of these models is that um, uh, ultimately we will have renewable sources that produce the electricity. In the meantime, we will have transitional, uh, but the uh, stages moving um, uh, through natural gas, but the key is to get off of coal. Coal is so energy dense and has such a high emission when it's burnt uh, to produce electricity. And remember that much of the South of the US is still based on coal uh, power generation um, and also the, also the Northeast. Um, the, and we have our own coal economies in Montana, Wyoming, uh, and they are uh, have various attempts to move that coal offshore, sell it, take it to the coast and sell it. Um, but, uh, but the financial, coal is too expensive now. It, coal has not died out because of, of um, running out of coal or lack of demand, coal has been substituted for by natural gas because natural gas is cheaper. Coal is simply more expensive. So the market, this is an example of pricing um, driving the better outcome. So the, the comment or the question um, wrote again and said that he, he was talking about the home use of natural gas. So let me. Well, I don't. I don't know the regulations in different entities. You'd you'd have to, you know, uh, do more research on that. I I don't know. I don't know that Cal. I, I, I just can't say if California has passed a, uh, a natural gas ban for, um, residential yet. Part of that is wrapped up in the cap and trade system and the way that California's climate strategy works, the pricing signals on low carbon fuels and um, so on. Again, and I, I know we're, we're very short on time I and I have, question. I'm sorry. Was there someone else asking a question? Yes. Oh, I have a question um, if, it, if it, I, I can. Um, I'm Patricia. I'm, I was interested in alternatives to um, um, propane, natural gas, liquid gas, whatever from fracking that we all have to use out here. And I know it's very big in Australia and even in parts of this country to have anaerobic digesters for your own kitchen scraps and certain um, uh, plant waste materials to make your own. Um, that could be expanded on a big say a scale. It might help make a dent. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with this uh, alternative um, method, but these are very small, usable. Um, containers that you can put in any backyard. They're only about five feet square. And uh, there's a lot of them on YouTube um, that you can see people um, using them. They're very user friendly. And I wonder what you think about these alternatives. Like I use solar panels. I'm off grid, um, photovoltaics for electricity, but I'd certainly like to get off propane if I could. Well, there may and, be uh, there may be individual one, um, option there, that I there may be individual situations where that kind of solution is very appropriate, um, um, where uh, you're you're handling it at your own scale on your own site, and you can meet all the safety and so on regulations that go with it. Typically. Uh, for 
urban densities, it's much more efficient to do things at scale. That's why you have a sewage treatment plant rather than everybody having their own methane digester in their own backyard. Um, it's, it's, it's the economy of scale efficiency. And so, but if you are indeed uh, living out in rural areas, then uh, take a look at those solutions. I mean, it, it technically they, they make sense that you can use the methane. Certainly Arcade is using the methane uh, from our sewage uh, uh, plant for you know, doing some generation electricity generation right here. Um, the livestock methane is huge. When you talk about feedlots, cattle feedlots, that's one of the largest sources of agricultural emissions is cows um, and, and methane emissions from both ends of the cow. And uh, so there's lots of work on digesters, uh, feed additives for cattle, this new business of putting seaweed in their diet that reduces uh, methane uh, production, uh, capturing their manure, uh, putting it into digesters and doing exactly what you're talking about, capturing the methane, putting it into a pipeline or burning it on site. So the, the theory, the theory is uh, works. It's the scale and the appropriateness of the technology for where you're located. Andrea, I wanna thank you. There are a lot of very nice comments about your presentation in the chat. I wanna make sure to draw your attention to that. Um, okay. And then I did get one more question that came to me directly. Um, what have you heard about a climate focus or lack thereof in the Department of Agriculture under Vilsack? Um, Vilsack knows what he's doing and he now has a direction uh, to uh, uh, follow the administration guidelines. He, as I understand it, they have they have a, a Climate 21 program uh, that came out of the transition team uh, to guide uh, the natural land sector um, uh, actions that can be taken in agriculture and forestry to increase sequestration and reduce emissions. And I would refer you to the Vilsack Climate 21 plan and that's his marching orders. And he, he knows the issues uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I have no reason to think that he won't be earnest in trying to uh, carry them out. It's complicated. As we talked earlier, there's the life cycle assessment. Are you doing more harm than good? But uh, that's why you need to be careful in what policies you actually uh, put in. There's talk of a carbon bank where offsets from agriculture are that are produced by one entity can be used by another entity. Uh, I'd take a look at the Climate 21 plan for the natural land sector. All right, and do you have time for one more question? I'm good. Okay, are there moves to make producers responsible for the recycling of their products? So. Uh, well, we'll have to watch the regulations that, that come out of this administration. They've been spotty um, in the past. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know of uh, any in, on the plate right now. I, I haven't heard that language being used, but um, that would be, remember the three policy tools, regulation, incentives, and pricing. So if we make pollution expensive, then they'll find ways not to do it. If we incentivize them not to do it by providing them in the subsidies to invest in equipment, that's another way to do it. If we regulate, that's another way to do it. So you can think of the different um, tools that we can use. Well, that are, that's all the questions I see in the chat. Um, again, thank you so much for being here today.